for the Great Commission Center. If you haven't been there yet, you're welcome to come visit. It's up at the, at the intersection of Plaza and Central in uh, East Central Charlotte. Uh, it's the location of the old Green Memorial Church, which closed and gave the association the property, and that's become now our Great Commission Center. We're now, today, uh, six churches are meeting for worship, all ethnic congregations. Um, we're adding at least one more new church next year. So we'll have, it's possible, we may have eight churches there by the end of next year, but um, right now it looks like seven for sure. Um, eight would be our max, in case you're wondering, how do you do that? Well, it's, it's fun. But we have a good time together. And um, Todd Jones on our staff at, at Metrolina is our coordinator of all the work that goes on at the center. Actually, I just left there a little bit ago and he's busy making sure everybody's where they're supposed to be this morning as the day gets underway. Um, we are as an association ready to work with you in any way that we can through this time of transition. Um, good to hear the news today of John Ray coming to be with you. Be praying for him as he starts that work. Um, I do want to say that it was very sad to hear Pastor Michaels having to leave, but we are working with him in these days to find other ways to minister here in Metro Atlanta, and we're thankful the way that God's providing in that. Woodlawn does need faithful Christians here to be part of what God wants to do in this place to lead your fellowship to be an outwardly focused, mission-oriented church. That's why we exist as church. We're not here just to be here on Sundays and have a nice, fun time and go home and eat chicken. Um, although chicken is good. I like chicken, okay? But we are here to, we're here not just to like chicken, but we're here to be on mission in Jesus' name. And if we're doing that, God will bless. If we're not, he won't be very blunt. So that's the mission. That's what we're about as an association. Today, as we look together into God's Word in Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Um, one of the things that we're talking about, what it takes to be a worthy church, that's you know, own mission is the key. Uh, but what does it take to be a worthy Christian or a worthy church member? Uh, some may say if you're, uh, what would be a worthy church member? You know, if you come every week, if you come to Bible study every week, if you uh, give a tithe, if you're a witness to others. Uh, those are good things to do. Those are all scriptural. They're all wise. But they're not what Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. There are four personal qualities and one personal activity that are required to make one's life, one's life walk and one's uh, ministry worthy as a Christian. These four qualities and this activity validate our profession of faith in Jesus. In case you're wondering what in the world are those, let's read and see what they say from Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 6. Look at me with, look with me at God's word this morning. Let's see what we can learn from Ephesians 4. Paul the Apostle writes this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one, to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray together. God, speak to us today through your word. Help us to hear clearly what the Spirit is saying to the church today so that we might be in the center of what you're doing in these days, in our own lives uh, in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in the life of the church here at Woodlawn. Lord, thank you for blessing us today as we meet together and open your word together in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Paul here, as he says, is a prisoner of the Lord, meaning one who's been down the hard path, one who's had a hard road to hoe, as my dad used to say, one who's faced the difficulties, one who's heard the criticism, one who's, who's felt the pain literal pain, he says, as a prisoner of the Lord, verse 1, we're to walk or live worthy of the calling we've received, that calling to Christ, that calling to faith, that calling to be part of the church of Jesus. Paul's basically insisting here that there be a balance between what we profess, our profession of faith, and our practice of faith. In other words, it's not just enough to say something, 
uh, we need to be doing something about this faith that we profess. And we were called and invited by Jesus' word and blood to come to God for salvation, full and free. Now we're called and expected to live like it as disciples of Jesus. I guess one way to look at this is this is all about the, our measure of maturity. It's something we've dealt with recently in the association and in, in teaching and sharing with the churches. You know, a lot of the church planting movements and explosive growth of the church around the world, um, something's been identified that we all, especially here in the United States, need to put our finger on. And that is that if we have the wrong model of maturity we're looking at, uh, we're going to miss the point of what it really means to be Christians in the church. Our model in the church, at least most of my lifetime, has been more of a, more of a knowledge-based maturity. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, the more you know, the more mature you are, which means the longer you've lived, the more, the more mature you are. Now, that may make sense in that perspective, but I think if you stop and look at it with me a little bit, we may or may not be more mature the older we get and the more knowledge we gain. So is the kind of maturity we need to have uh, more knowledge-based, or is it obedience-based? Christians around the world where God's moving in dramatic ways to grow churches and bring millions into faith in Christ uh, are discovering the fact that God calls us to follow Him. Jesus calls us to trust and obey Him. So it's obedience-based maturity we're looking for. It's entirely possible, that being said, that a 17-year-old girl who's sold out to Jesus and is ready to do whatever the scriptures tell her to do could very well be more mature than a 70-year-old man who's been a member of the church for 30 years and acts like he could care less what Jesus had to say. Hello. Does that make sense? That's the point. Uh, so we're looking for obedience based on maturity, which is what Paul is calling us to here in Ephesians chapter 4. I mean, some Christians say, uh, uh, say what they say and do what they uh, believe what they uh, think is just between them and God. I actually heard that in terms of accountability. Um, I don't have to answer to anybody. I'm not responsible. I'm sorry. That's not what the New Testament says. We're responsible to one another in the body of Christ. Um, Ephesians 4 gives clear direction as how God expects us to relate to one another as Christians in the body we call the church. But how? How do we do that? And how do I live a life worthy of the calling I've received and the calling you've received to be a Christian? First, let's look at those four qualities that are necessary for the worthy life. Okay, so there are four qualities and there's one activity. First, we're going to look at the four qualities. First quality, personal quality, number one is humility. Paul says it there in the first verse. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've been called, actually verse two, with all humility. Pursuing humility as a Christian. Humility really is just low, being lowly of mind or lowliness of mind or considering others better than ourselves. Humility is the personal attitude that prepares us for God's blessing. By practicing humility, we're positioned to experience the power of God as we yield to Him and humble ourselves before Him. And the scripture says, James said, Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will lift you up. And sad to say, the exact opposite is true. If we refuse to humble ourselves, if we lift ourselves up in pride, the Lord will cast us down and get our attention. Now, I don't like that more than you do, but that's the way it works. It's the way the Lord works to get us in the right place of trusting and following Him. So if you want uh, the exhilaration of the peaceful power of God flowing through your life, humble yourself before it. Trust in Him with humility, and you'll see what God can do when He has someone He can trust. Humility doesn't insist on its own way. Humility yields to others in love. Now note that the opposite of humility is pride. God resists the proud, as we said a minute ago, but He gives grace to the humble. Jonathan Edwards is the one who put it this way. The best protection one can have from the devil and his schemes is a humble heart. So that first personal quality is humility. And really it's the one that paves the way for all the rest. Because if we're humble before the Lord and humble before each other, we can get along 
and live together and see the kind of things happen we need to see, as Ephesians 4 says in just a few minutes. So let's go on to the next one. Second personal quality Paul calls us to is gentleness. Gentleness is one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Jesus said, blessed are the gentle, they'll inherit the earth, Matthew 5, 5. But why gentleness? I'll just be really honest. I mean, I'm a guy. Guys aren't necessarily known for gentleness. Now, we ought to be, but we're not. You know, if you look at parenting, very often the father's the lawgiver and the mother's grace. I mean, the mother's the comforter. Now, I've known some families where it's the opposite, and that's okay, okay? But I really wrestled with the whole gentleness thing until I really started thinking about it more closely. Why is gentleness so important? Think about it this way. Have you ever had someone who was harsh with you, who was insensitive to you and your needs, and he treated you like that on an ongoing way? How did it make you feel? Doesn't feel very good, does it? Uh-uh. Now think about the opposite. Have you ever been in a difficult situation and had someone who was really caring toward you, nice to you, encouraging you, and gently trying to help you along the way? Which one do you prefer? Need I ask? I mean, hello. I mean, gentleness makes a difference. Gentleness makes, makes life worth moving along through. That's why gentleness is so important in the body of Christ. We need to be gentle with one another because last time I checked, we're all different, right? And I just learned not long ago that men and women are different, you know? That was a joke. I've known for a long time that was true, okay? But, but all of us are different, okay? That doesn't, mean we don't, we, that doesn't mean we don't deal with difficult issues, but we deal with difficult issues, challenges, etc., with gentleness and without an agenda that hurts others instead of it helps others. Gentleness makes loving relationships possible. Gentleness is love in action, to be really honest. It's caring enough about someone to put your agenda aside so that you can share God's love with them. This isn't supposed to be the exception. This is supposed to be the rule. This is how we live. This is how we serve with one another. Third personal quality is the quality of patience. Another one of the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5. Patience, one described it as being love that's willing to wait. Yeah, I love you, so I'm willing to hang in there with you a little bit. You ever notice that? If you really care for someone, you really want their best interests and not yours, you'll go out of your way to take care of them. That's part of the essence of this gift of patience. Impatience reveals selfishness and not selflessness. We want our way and we want it now. That's not patience. It's not good either. Since God is so very patient with us, why can't we be patient with each other? You know? Refuse to demand your own way. Patience says, I'm willing to let God work all things together for good through what I'm dealing with. You know, in churches today, impatience causes more division, more hurt, more damage than we want to know. Patience brings unity and strength. One writer put it this way, second only to suffering, waiting, or the essence of patience, waiting may be the greatest teacher and trainer in godliness, maturity, and genuine spirituality that most of us ever encounter. Patience is an absolute necessity when building relationships. I've noticed, too, just having dealt in some some dealings recently, the more I pray for someone, the more patience God gives me to work with them. You ever notice that? If I'm not praying for them, if I just, if I don't give them the time of day, I'm willing just to do basically whatever, whatever I can get by doing. Patience doesn't allow that, especially when we're depending on God in prayer through the process. That's personal quality number three. Personal quality number four, similar but different. Tolerance, or as our translation says, accepting one another in love. Connected, very similar to patience, but somewhat different. This is, another word for this is forbearance. This basically means it's bearing with one another in love. Now, not the new tolerance that basically says everybody's okay and what everybody does is okay, which is not biblical. We're talking about biblical tolerance, okay? 
This is a readiness to live with the faults and idiosyncrasies of others, knowing that we have our own. Hello. It's about accepting in love as Jesus accepts us in love. Another writer put it this way, to live above with saints we love, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know, that's a different story, right? Mark Lowry, the great theologian, is the one who put it this way. You know there are people in your life, maybe probably people in your family, you'll cry at their funeral, but you don't want to go on vacation with them. Now, some of y'all are being way too serious this morning. Come on. I mean, you know you have people like that. Oh, oh uh-huh. Well, then you're probably that person. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've got a couple family members I can think of. Well, well, yeah, I'll cry at their funeral, but spend a week with them at the beach in one house? I don't know. But tolerance causes us to do that. Forbearance causes us to do that. It's an extra level of patience and love given freely to others. Now, we said a moment, moment ago, it's really, it, it's, it's all about acknowledging the fact that since all of us have idiosyncrasies and our own strange kind of ways, we need to care for others in the same kind of process. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Because all, as one lady speaking at Women of Faith Conference several years ago said, all God's children got issues. All of us do. But how do we bear with one another in love through the process? It means we care enough about our fellow believers that we refuse to let anything keep us from loving them the way Jesus loved them and the way that Jesus loves us all. So, <clears throat> those are the four personal qualities we need to pursue. Humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. The last thing we look at is at the end of the verse, end of the passage, where Paul is talking about that necessary personal activity which is about keeping the unity God makes possible. Maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in the church. Go back and look at it where it says there in verse, um, verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Basically saying, doing whatever it takes to remain one as the body of Christ. As then he lays out after that, every way we're one. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, etc. Uh, God calls us to that unity as a church so that we can be a representative in his light and his witness in the community around us. Verse 3 talks about, you want to unpack those words. It talks about diligently keeping, making every effort, having a burning eagerness to cherish and to guard carefully the unity of the spirit, the unity of the fellowship with the peace that binds us. Now, the way Paul writes this, and it's clear, the Holy Spirit gives us that unity. He produces that unity. It's our job to maintain that unity, to do what we need to do to stay together as the body. It's our responsibility to make every effort to maintain that unity as the body of Christ. Every effort being peacemakers. When Jesus prepared to face the cross. He prayed for us in John chapter 17. Read this later if you would. Well, what was the focus of his prayer? He prayed this, and I quote, May they, those who would follow him, the church, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me, Father. He prayed that we would be one. Now, why do I make a big deal of this? Well, one, because Jesus prayed for it. Two, because it's a, it's a, it's a proven fact and hope that unity is the ultimate goal for life and ministry in the local church. Now, we talk about what, what are we about, what do we do. We talk about missions, evangelism, etc. All those are necessary and important. But if we're not united in the process, the world around us is not, not going to want to hear anything we have to say. They can tell. So we act like people around us can't see or know what's going on in the church or what's going on in our, our relationships, our neighborhoods, etc. They notice very carefully and remember, which is why we as Christians have to be careful to be united in the faith as we move ahead and trust God in the work he's called us to do. Without unity, we're dead and repulsive to the world. With unity, we are one body 
with one spirit, with one hope, with one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who rules over all and is in all of us. Everything we are and think and do is to be permeated with oneness. Oneness as Christian and as church. He's reminding us of all that holds us together. Here's the need. We need to major on the reasons we have for togetherness rather than the reasons we have for division. Don't risk losing what God's blessed you with by the Spirit's work among you. Be one in Christ. Now, what could that look like? I was thinking, driving down here this morning from an experience when I was pastoring up in the mountains, we'd had a situation there where one particular man decided to cause trouble in the church. And when he did, it got messy. In the process, we were in the, in the process of moving to Charlotte. So we left and came to Charlotte to pastor here 20 years ago. But what he had done in the church had caused such damage in the fellowship that after, he, after we were gone, actually they waited until after we left. After we were gone, the church basically told him, you're not welcome here anymore. You've divided our church, and that's not what Jesus called us to do. So you need to find somewhere else to go to church. Or better yet, you need to repent and come back to Jesus and trust him with us. But he didn't want to do that, so he left. Interestingly enough, the community is pretty tight there. He went to another church. After a few months, he wanted to be a deacon. The leadership of the church got together and knew what had happened at our church. Met with him and said, you just need to know, until we see some serious life change in you, you'll never be a deacon in this church. Some people may say, now, why would they do that? Because they're guarding the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's what that looks like. When someone gets out of line, the church deals with them. Lovingly, patiently, with forbearance. But you deal with them until what is right is made right in the church. Otherwise, the community around you says, eh, they're not that interested. They're not interested in being united as Jesus told us to be united. It's not just going along to get along. It's being the body of Christ, which means we have standards to follow in this book and a, represent, a representative witness to maintain in the community where God's planted us. Now, the mistake many make is uh, thinking our way of thinking, our perspective is the one to follow. And if people don't agree with me, they just need to know. It's in a personal thing. This is a body thing. It's about the truth being spoken in love. God's way is love. It is. But there's truth that backs it up. Loving him most of all and loving one another so that we can see the unity we need maintained in the body he loves. But how do we get at that? How do we live that out? How do we, how do we act and how do we discipline ourselves as a body? These are important questions that very often churches in our day ignore to our harm. There's a reason between 80 and 90% of the churches in the Southern Baptist Convention are declining or plateaued. It's not just us, it's across the board, everybody. Um, declining or plateaued, which means there isn't growth happening. Let that go on for a certain number of years, and as the kids say, hi-ho, nobody's home. We have to be serious about pursuing what God wants us to pursue. Being on mission as he's called us to be on mission, and being the body, guarding the unity God's called us to guard as we serve and follow him. But how do we do that? Go back to the first verse of Ephesians 4. We do it by practicing humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance. Doing that, we can aim to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace at Woodlawn and wherever else we find ourselves. So it's time for a personal spiritual checkup. How are you doing in the areas of humility? How are you doing in the areas of gentleness, area of gentleness, in the area of patience, in the area of forbearance or tolerance? How are you doing, Woodlawn, at unity keeping? Okay, I know we know what the Bible says about it now. We've heard that. We've probably heard this before. But the question isn't, do we know it? 
The question is, what are we doing about it? How is this affecting the way we live out the witness God has called us to live out? Will we actually do what God says to do? Or will we refuse to obey? I've been with Metroline Association now for 12 years this past September. The hardest thing I have to do in our 151 churches and church plants is to work with churches in transition. Transition's okay. The hardest part is working with churches in transition where the needs are significant. And to be really honest, the needs are significant at Woodlawn right now. So what are we going to do about it? I know. See, I, I'm, I'm the associational guy. I can come in and preach, and I have to go back to, to where I serve, and, and uh, you all have to move on this or do whatever you need to do. What do you need to do? I don't know, but the Lord does. I'm trying to give you some structure today as to how you need to follow through with whatever you need to do to be on mission together. John Ray will be able to do a good job leading you as interim pastor, but he's an interim pastor. What are you going to do about your next pastor? And what's he going to look like? And what's his focus going to be? Um, the needs are great. Now, I know you've heard, and I've been here for now for, for a number of years, and we've talked about needs around you in this particular community. Mission field is all around you. Schools in need of ministry. Neighborhoods in need of ministry. Uh, a whole lot of people that need to know Jesus. So what are we going to do about it? Today we've seen some of how we can go about doing what we need to do about it with humility and patience and, and forbearance, etc. But the things we need to do, that's what you've got to seek the Lord on. Lord, how do you want us to pursue life together as a church? You say, you know, just doing it the way we've always done it, that doesn't work anymore. Actually, it really never did work. We thought it did because we could maintain to maintain. But with a significant number of our churches that are in serious decline now, the needs are significant and great. You know the good news, though? Jesus is still Lord. And he's able to do amazing things when we trust and obey him. So, Woodlawn. It's in your court. How are you going to trust and follow the Lord as individuals and as a church family? That's your call. You've got to decide that. My prayer is that the Lord will guide you as a fellowship of Christians to be on mission together with humility, with patience, with uh, forbearance, with love. That Christ might be honored as you unite together in Jesus' name to be on mission in this place. Now, let's just throw out something out there that's, that's obvious to anybody that comes to visit, okay? We're mostly, shall we say, over 39 years old white, okay? And I think that probably covered most everybody, okay? Age really isn't the issue. The issue is what are we going to do with what God's given us? How are we going to follow him on mission where he's planted us? That's what you've got to decide. Uh, the doors are wide open in some specific areas of ministry and mission all around you. So what are we going to do? Um, yeah. Remember, I was visiting one of our churches a number of years ago. They were down to 16. Now, born 16 here today, so y'all are doing good compared to that, Okay. But I asked him, I said, how are you engaging your community? And the, the one deacon remaining said, said, Bob, we're okay. We, we, we love our little fellowship, and we're just going to keep on going. I said, okay, you're down to 16. How long do you think that's going to last? They had figured it up. He said, we've got enough money to go another three and a half years. And I had to bluntly tell him, brother, that's not why you're here. Uh-uh. That's why we're here. We could start an optimist club, you know. Now, I'm an optimist, but is it why we're here? No. We're here to trust and follow Jesus. So, I toss it back in your court. 
And just know we're ready to walk with you and serve with you every way we can as you and we look to the future. As I get ready to close today, it's always interesting to me when a church sings the particular hymn we're going to close with in just a little bit. We're going to have to have a prayer before that. But um, in terms of your song at the end of the service today, uh, it's been one of the most significant ones in my life. I, we were singing I Surrender All at my home church that Sunday in 1977 when that Sunday God called me to the ministry. So that song stuck with me for all these decades since. Um, but notice, it doesn't say I surrender some or I surrender kind of, sort of. It's I surrender all. So my, my question to you, my request to you, as you think about who you are, as you think about the opportunities around you, as you think about the challenges that you and many, many other churches face, how much are you willing to give? How much are you willing to yield so that the Lord can have his way at Woodlawn Baptist Church? How far? How far will you go? My encouragement would be to adopt a three-word statement. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. You've heard of the challenges in China in recent years. Um, you've heard of the explosive growth of the church in China in recent years. Not long ago, uh, a leader from, from the church in China was asked, what do we need to really see another revival in China? You know, the, the Shantung revival in the 1930s is really what gave birth to much of what's happened over the last decades. Uh, millions coming to Christ, a significant missionary effort, uh, an underground church unparalleled around the world. You know what the church leader said they needed? So we need more persecution. We've gotten too comfortable. Another pastor was visiting, and it was, uh, the past Chinese leader was, was talking about challenges they were facing. And the pastors, American pastor said, we'll pray, back in the United States, we'll pray that God will stop all this. And the Chinese pastor stopped, and he said, no, pray that. Pray that we'll be faithful in the face of the persecution. That's the call. That's what Paul's talking about here. A prisoner for the Lord. I mean, when's the last time any of us were in prison because of what we believed? Paul had been. Still was, or was later. But still called the church to humility and gentleness, patience and forbearance, and maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's what God can do when we yield all to Him. So, as we prepare to sing, after we pray for a few moments, as we prepare to sing, I surrender all, ask yourself, am I really meaning these words? If I am, praise the Lord for that. Celebrate it. If not, just read through the words as we sing. Ask if you mean what you're saying. I just have to tell you, there's a mission field of at least 800,000 people in Mecklenburg County that do not follow Jesus. No, half the people or more don't go to church in Mecklenburg County. No. We have hundreds of thousands lost without Christ. And we dare not just stay comfortable while others are going to hell without Jesus. Dare we not? I pray not.